I'd like to discuss a few details of the exercise Servo Motion in Tinkercad. In my mind, the sort of chief objective here is to explore more programming practice, specifically regarding around organizing sketches in terms of functions. But at the same time, we're going to introduce the hobby servo because it's a very useful item that we will use quite a bit. Tinkercad itself is fairly limited. We can make them move, but we can't actually connect them to a mechanism. So the exercises are limited to kind of just showing a motion. Um, and I, I provide a sample circuit here. The details of the circuit uh, are not the focus of the exercise, but you do need to wire up a, uh, a circuit in order to make this go. Um, just for reference, I'm going to be drawing today from the lecture sample code. Uh, under the servo section, there's the SHM servo uh, sample sketch. And that's what I'm going to be using as an example. Um, but I suggest that you consider alter other possibilities and, and think carefully about how to create some structured motion. So I have a sample sketch here. And <clears throat> the essence is that there is a microservo, a hobby microservo. This particular one has a pinout where uh, the power lead is in the center pin. Not all servos have the same pinout. But I'm using a 5 volts from the Arduino to power the servo. And then there's a control signal, the green wire, that is routed from uh, digital output D9. All my examples use D9 just arbitrarily. Uh, any pin will actually, any digital output pin should actually work to drive the servos. So just to see this go, I'm going to start the simulation and note a couple of things. First, I have a couple extra volt meters. There's just one showing the 5 volt supply to guarantee it's 5 volts. And then uh, there's a oscilloscope that is required for you to use as well, which is showing a pulse that's varying in width. This is the command signal to the servo. And this is a, a format that was invented by the radio control community. And it's a pulse that varies in length between 1 and 2 milliseconds. And it's the length of the pulse that encodes the, the target angle of the servo in basically a kind of analog way. It's a digital output in that it's a binary output, but it's definitely encoding a analog value. And if we zoom out a little bit, that is showing uh, 5 milliseconds across the scope, or half a millisecond per division. If I, if I update that to, to look at a longer time scale, I look at 20 milliseconds per division, what we see is a, lo a long series of pulses, each varying in width. And this is the standard. Typically, these pulses repeat at a rate of 50 hertz, that's 20 milliseconds apart, and each one encodes an angle. And that determines the sort of basic update rate of the command to the servo. It doesn't help to try to command it faster than that, because the pulses only come out every 20 milliseconds. That basically determines how fast you can try to change the set points. We'll get back to sort of physical hobby servos more once we have kits and are working in physical electronics. But just in summary, it is a kind of uh, a fully closed loop device. There's a position sensor, usually a tiny potentiometer, measuring the angle of the output shaft. There is a circuit that is using that as a, refer as a, as a measurement and comparing against the reference signal that you provide to decide whether to drive the motor forward or backwards. There's, it's typically the motor is mostly running in a kind of saturated mode where it runs at full speed. And then there's a linear region around the target where it will slow down to approach the target. And a very small dead band right at the target to avoid it chattering for tiny errors. And these have all their quirks that we'll understand much better when we get to physical practice. But for now, we can just treat it as a kind of controllable output device where you send in a position command, and it moves to the position at some rate. And if you set a series of changing position commands, then it will, by and large, track that path. Although the accuracy of that track depends upon a lot of factors, including uh, the maximum speed you're trying to achieve, the specific servo, kind of the loading, all sorts of other factors. But for now, we'll treat it just as an output device and mostly think about programming. So that is, that is the essence of the circuit. And um, I do want you to definitely wire in the Arduino, the servo, and the oscilloscope so you can also look at your pulses um, and sort of explore that pulse train. I'm going to set this back to uh, half a millisecond per division, which is um, the oscilloscope sometimes a little fussy there. There we go. Um, so that you can see the individual pulse varying. That's 500 microseconds per division. So let's look a little bit at the, at the rest of the program here. We can see in the serial monitor, there's a series of numbers coming out. Those are the target angles. The servo library on the Arduino takes angles between 0 and 180. And physical servos typically have a kind of 180 degree range of travel, although some can go a little more. Um, it's always, almost always, most servos that we use will have a fixed travel. They don't rotate continuously. So they're always used in either some kind of angular position mode or with a tie rod to get some kind of like specific linear mode. And then we see a plot here showing a kind of ringing sinusoidal waveform. And that's the detail here of the sketch today. So I'm going to stop the simulation so I can close these windows and look a little bit at the code.
Um, I gave this example uh, mostly because it demonstrates that we can get beyond tables and actually write more kind of complicated mathematical functions that produce motion, um, just because it's a nice technique. Uh, it's very physically motivated. In some sense, what this is doing, this simulator, is it's, it's simulating a mass spring system as a second order differential equation, and then using that as data to drive this physical servo. So it's, it's giving the servo a, a more fluid kind of motion that's physically motivated, although it's coming from a simulated source. So to kind of get down to the, the heart of it, let's get the ringing servo function, which is what's generating the actual movement. It takes four parameters, uh, a reference position, which is the center of the oscillation, a stiffness, a damping, and a duration in seconds. So the K and B correspond to the spring constant and the damping constant for the simulated spring and damper. And what we see is the second order differential equation. Um, there's a acceleration that's computed that's QDD, which is the spring constant times the displacement between the current position and the desired position. And then a damping term B times QD, which is uh, basically applies an acceleration to always in the opposite direction from the velocity to suck mechanical energy out of the oscillation. It's simulated mechanical energy. So in this case, it's all about this virtual mass spring damper system. Then there's an Euler integrator. Uh, it takes Q equals Q plus QD times DT. That's basically taking the position and then adding one discrete time step of velocity. And then the same thing for updating the velocity with one discrete time step of acceleration. There are other integration schemes. This is a straightforward one, which for the time scales we're talking about is numerically stable. Although it is possible to choose parameters here that will make this go unstable and produce sort of wildly unstable oscillations. The servo.write, svo.write, svo is my servo object. Um, that actually sends the command to the servo and then I print it for plotting. And then here I'm waiting a duration between the integration steps. And this is also just chosen to match the fact that the servo has a finite update rate. It turns out that integrating the system at 50 hertz is sufficient to be, remain stable. And that both delays the real time till the next, approximately the next time that the servo is updated, as well as uh, can't keep track of the duration for, for timing the ring. So uh, a couple other points here. Um, the loop function has just a couple calls to this primitive. I'm calling it a motion primitive because it's a function that generates an entire movement over time. And that's now kind of an action in our language, in our grammar for this movement. For your exercise, I'd like you to think about some other possible sort of phrases here and how you might parameterize other functions or make a, kind of a phrase structure around some primitives. Uh, to get a little variety. And effectively, the outcome is a kind of kinetic composition. Before we were doing a melody composition, now it's going to be kind of a moving composition on one motor. And then last, just to get back to the kind of uh, more uh, sort of technical details of using the Arduino, um, we'll note that at the very top there is an inclusion of servo.h. Servo is not a automatically available library. It's a library that has to be specifically included. This notation is C++ notation for including a header file which is the standard way that we make the definitions of the library available to your program. So it's an obligatory line to make sure that that library code is available. Um, we declare a const for our servo pin. And then line 7, servo svo, is declaring a servo object. The servo object is some C++ uh, class, and we're going to create an instance of that class. You can give it whatever name you like. Here I just called it svo. That's your name that you get to choose. And that just creates this object. And once again, this is kind of using a C++ structure in a way that more or less insulates you from the sort of C++ idioms. Um, and you can pretend that SVO is just a global variable. Um, you do need to initialize it. In the setup function, there's, a, there's an attach method that's called, which uh, basically configures that pin to use the physical hardware pin. And behind the scenes, this does set up uh, some mechanism inside of the timer interrupt and with the timer uh, hardware on the chip to enable creating this pulse train on that pin. And that is part of the library function. It, it hooks into the timer interrupt, and it can regularly turn the pin on and then turn it off at a fixed interval later. It's a very flexible library. It can handle many, many servos of an Arduino and uh, gives you kind of an easy access to a lot of program motion. So that's kind of a quick walkthrough of this specific solution to uh, the exercise. Um, the key really is. Um, I think, uh, get, get, just figure it out, learn how to wire it up, you know, learn how to set up a servo on a pin. Um, think about program structure, how you might create 
one or more motion primitives that create some kind of action over time, and then think about how you might create uh, one or more phrase functions that compose those into a motion sequence. Um, and that's kind of the central idea.